hearing now in the Rayburn House office building. This is a hearing on the future of the nation's energy grid. Live coverage resuming on C-SPAN 3. Attention of, uh, of all of our audience on the uh, witnesses. Thank you. So the chair will recognize himself and I will ask you, uh, Mr. Halvey, uh, to please elaborate on your testimony that permitting on federal lands is the major uh, obstacle to siting transmission in uh, the West. That issue is not generally within this committee's uh, jurisdiction, but rather within the uh, jurisdiction of the Committee on Natural Resources, but I don't think this is a widely understood kind of political reverse takedown, that <laughs> it's not the problem that the federal government has with the states, but the problems that the states have with the federal government, as uh, represented by the management of uh, the federal lands, especially across the West. Could you elaborate on that and perhaps give us some specific examples? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, let me mention a couple of things. Uh, at a meeting in uh, uh, of, of the Western Governors in February, Governor Otter from Idaho uh, made the statement very clearly that in those instances where uh, we have the opportunity to site transmission lines and not go through federal lands. We're often going to want to exercise um, that. Th there are a couple of issues, I think, that come to mind in terms of the permitting with federal lands. One, if you live in the West, it's, it's difficult to avoid federal lands. Many of the states uh, are, are, are covered uh, with lands under federal jurisdiction, both the Departments of, of Interior and the Departments of, of, of Agriculture. Uh, so so that, that, that that's certainly... Uh, uh, an issue. Second, there, there's no priority system for dealing with lease applications. Um, it, it, it's on a first come, first served basis. Uh, one of the things that we're doing with the Western Renewable Energy Zones is, is really pointing out what, what we think is a critical issue, which is that there are places that, that are really better for uh, not only locating renewable energy, but there are also transmission corridors that are going to be more important in, in moving that renewable energy. We believe that there ought to be some kind of a way to recognize that priority um, and, and to do the transmission work, the, the permitting work that's necessary uh, uh, to get those, those uh, uh, facilities located. Um, we think in, in, in many cases it, it, it's not unusual to see five, seven, or, or even ten years to locate transmission lines when they go through through federal land. Um, you repeat that? Uh, repeat yes, that, that fact. That, that, it, that it's not unusual to see five, seven, ten year uh, time periods uh, in, in terms of getting uh, lines approved through federal lands. So when the states go to federal Right. agencies. It takes five to seven to ten years. It, it, it can, it, 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 there are certainly instances where, where it, it has taken that long. Many of the, uh, <clears throat> the applications that we see now that are going through that process, um, it, in fact, Governor Rounds from South Dakota um, it, it was talking about a line to run from South Dakota to Minnesota, um, and, and at one of our meetings he mentioned that they'd been working on it for two years uh, and, and they've, they've had very little success in, in moving it through the federal permitting process. Um, and, 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 and he sort of got a response of a chuckle uh, from, from people in the audience, uh, essentially suggesting two years you've barely started. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, there's a great frustration on the so part. So what you're saying is that the states are, were working together cooperatively yes. to try to find a solution sure. to that regional North Dakota, Minnesota issue, but because of the federal government, there was a multi-year uh, delay in getting to a point where the issue could be resolved. That, that, I, think is, that I think is the sense of, of the western states, that the federal permitting process is difficult, it's, it's, it's onerous, it's time consuming, and in many cases there, there are requirements that don't add any value um, to, to the permitting process. We, we would hope to see something that uh, one would recognize those areas that have a priority because of the richness of their renewable resources, um, uh, but, but more than that, recognize that if we are going to meet uh, any requirements for renewable portfolio standards or carbon reduction, uh, we've got to do a much better job of matching up how long it takes to do renewable development with how long it takes to get the transmission to those developments. So again, if, if you could, not to make too fine of a point of, uh, of this, but you're saying out west it's very difficult if you're dealing with the remote 
areas where the wind and the sun might be strongest, geothermal as well, uh, to create any kind of a transmission system without at some point confronting this federal issue. That is absolutely true. And no matter how cooperative the states are, and your testimony is that in most instances states are trying to resolve these issues, the federal government serves as uh, an impediment sometimes of uh, 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 such a nature as to just paralyze the process. That is correct. Okay, that's very helpful to us. Thank you. Um, let me now turn and uh, recognize the uh, gentleman from Kentucky, uh, Mr. Whitfield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your testimony. Um, Mr. Wellenkopf, uh, back in April of 2009, and the New York Times quoted you in an article saying that <clears throat> new coal and nuclear plants may be unnecessary. And I, I know that Chairman Barton and Mr. Walden and some others sent you a letter about that, and I have not had an opportunity to read your response, but you are certainly not opposed to coal and nuclear power. I'm, I'm sure of that. That is correct. I'm not, I'm not opposed and, to coal and, and nuclear and, power. And since I didn't even read the New York Times article, would you basically explain what you were referring to when you made that statement? I would be happy to. Thank you for the question. I was referring to basically a scenario where uh, if we look at the diversity of a number of renewable resources, which would include potentially Midwest wind that may have a diversity of, uh, of a delivery from uh, offshore wind and include solar and geothermal, biomass, and also include the demand side, looking at demand response, energy efficiency, um, distributed generation. Combining these things together with a smart grid, and, what, and, the, and the whole answer was, and, and the response was in the context of the smart grid. If you combine these things together, it may in fact be possible with a smart enough grid to effect, effectively provide these renewables as if they are base load, and that way with d displacing base load. And that, right. that was my, okay. my, uh, the context of my statement. Now, when you talk about a smart grid, do you have any idea or thoughts or have you seen any studies about what the cost would be to complete transformation to a smart grid? I have seen um, cost estimates anywhere from uh, 50 to 60 billion up to 200 billion. Okay. And to reach the scenario that you are referred to in the New York Times article that you just explained, what sort of time frame would you view this transformation taking place in? At least a 10 to 15 year time frame. 10 to 15, okay. Now on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals decision, um, have you all appealed that decision? FERC, has FERC appealed the decision? L let me check with my counsel. It is due in July. We haven't yet made a decision. We are looking at it now. Okay. I, I will tell you, though, I, I personally disagree with the Fourth Circuit decision. Okay. Well, I know there are many of us that hope you will appeal, but that is a decision that you all make, of course. Uh, f f Mr. Cohen, Ms. Azar, uh, Mr. Hibbard, uh, I would, could you tell me uh, the last, when the last new transmission line was built in each of your states? Uh, we, we are actually in Vermont uh, uh, in the process of upgrading uh, most of our transmission systems. So we actually have ongoing projects as we speak. Uh, the most major transmission line uh, that has ever been sited in Vermont, uh, uh, the, the, the dock it ended two years ago and the line is currently uh, almost complete today. And uh, how many miles is that line? Well, this is Vermont. The line was uh, 60 miles. 60 miles. And uh, what about it? You, you, Ms. Azar? Um, just yesterday, we approved a 32-mile, 345 kV line that costs about $220 million through the City of Madison. So in other words, the three commissioners essentially cited a transmission line through their backyards. Um, over the last eight years, we have spent $2.5 billion upgrading or creating uh, about 1,700 new miles of uh, transmission in the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, we have construction going on all over the state. 
Um, a line was just energized, I believe, last week, which was over 100 miles long. Mm -hmm. And as Congresswoman Baldwin indicated before I became commissioner, I was uh, um, uh, it, on the other side. I was uh, getting permits to for a 210-mile line uh, between Minnesota and Wisconsin, and that that line has been energized. Uh, Mr. Edward. In uh, Massachusetts, our, our most uh, populous. Could you turn on your microphone, please? Sorry about that. Uh, in Massachusetts, our most populous area, of course, is the Boston region, and it's where our heaviest electrical load is. Uh, and over the past 10 years, we have cited and have cited and had constructed a number of transmission enhancements to support the flow of power into Boston, including two major 345 kV lines to eliminate constraints between the Boston load pocket and the remainder of Massachusetts. And just one other question to you three. Um, with the anticipated increase in demand of electricity needs uh, over the next 15 or 20 years, do you think the existing system is adequate in your state? And uh, with regards to the increase in demand, um, we we continually update our system. So we're going to continue to do updates. We've been doing updates all along. Um, so I, I don't think that process ever stops. Okay. In Vermont, we've actually been able to uh, uh, to mitigate the any increase in our load over the last five years with energy efficiency. Uh, so I would say offhand that uh, with the completion of what is called the Southern Loop uh, in a couple of years uh, that I think our transmission uh, grid will be adequate for the next 10 to 15 years. Ms. Trevor. And I would give the, a similar answer. The answer to your question is yes. Uh, we, when we look at potential scenarios for load growth over time within Massachusetts and indeed within the New England region, we see that the transmission system including what's existing today and what's in the process of going through the regional planning process and inciting will, will uh, be more than adequate to support the movement of power throughout our region for a decade or two. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I see I've gone a minute and 25 seconds over. Okay. I, th I thank the gentleman. By the way, we will, we will be having a second round and perhaps a third round of questions of the witnesses if the gentleman is interested. Let me turn and recognize the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to put in the record, uh, with no objection, a, a letter from University of California, Berkeley, uh, Dr. Dan Kamen, who has a letter describing um, the reason and the appropriateness of expanding new transition lines. If I can put that without, in the record. No, without objection, it. it will be included. In uh, uh, Chairman uh, Wellinghoff, I wanted to ask you to expand on your thoughts on how FERC <coughs> could implement if it does receive backstop siting approval, uh, how it could implement a greenhouse gas performance interconnection standard for new transmission and or some criteria associated with compliance or fulfillment of the nation's renewable energy goals. Several of the other witnesses made reference to something in, in that nature. Could you tell us how you think that could work even though we've heard the the physical explanation that an electron is an electron is an electron. How could this, how could this function? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Congressman Inslee. Well, first of all, we, we would initiate a rulemaking, and certainly as, as part of that, uh, all stakeholders would have an opportunity to provide uh, any proposals as to how to implement uh, such a, a greenhouse gas performance standard. But in doing so, um, there's a couple ways it could be done. Uh, certainly, um, in looking at the, um, the um, current uh, emission permits from the um, generation stations, uh, from those it's based on known items uh, such as model and configuration of the generator and its emission control equipment and composition of fuel and the approximate runtime of the generator. You could take from that uh, also the annual uh, emissions are typically capped by a permit that can be used as the baseline to determine compliance. So we could take compliance, I think, from their current permit applications or new permit applications from uh, generating stations and uh, take that data, put it into a database and, and ultimately uh, from that use it to uh, determine uh, a greenhouse gas performance standard for uh, particular plants that were into the interconnect. So you can obviously do that for particular plants, but could you effectively uh, reference that to particular lines? In other words, are the plants specific enough to the lines that this type of standard could be applicable to lines? I think you'd have to do that 
by regions because it's all a matter of sort of displacement. You're not really delivering electron A to point B necessarily over an AC line. It's really pushing one electron down the road. Uh, so I think you'd have to do it basically on a regional basis, but I, I, I feel that we can do it, yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Azar, I appreciated your comments, uh, first off, about the appropriateness of federal backstop authority, and that's the general view that I share that it is appropriate, and I appreciate your views on that because of your incredible background in this area. But I also appreciate you making reference to the necessity of, of considering demand side issues when you do siting and planning. And I just, uh, I, I want to make sure you are aware that in the ACES bill, we do have a very specific policy that's a policy of the United States in regional electrical grid planning to meet these objectives should take into account all significant desired demand side and supply side options. Um, you want to comment on that as a good idea? Is there anything we should do to expand on that to make sure we consider that in part of our planning process? It is a very good idea, and uh, it, my point in raising it is that those kinds of um, solutions are oftentimes best made at the state level and mm -hmm. uh, because the states are going to understand how they are going to be setting up their distributed generation, how they are going to be setting up their energy efficiency and conservation measures uh, better than the federal government. So that, that's just, that was the point I was trying to make with regards to uh, why I thought a state-led process would be better with regards to those specific items. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chairman Hibbert, I wanted to ask you about cost allocations. I am told there recently has been a uh, the 345 KV NSTAR reliability project in transmission in the Boston area. And I'm told that the total cost of that was $334 million and 325 of that was spread across New England in the cost allocation system. Only 3 percent was assigned directly to Boston area ratepayers. Um, so regional cost allocation seems to work, at least in, in your area. Um, if cost allocation in general of that nature seems to be acceptable, should we not be able to fashion some other cost allocation more widely? Certainly. Thank you, Congressman. I think it's, it's instructive when thinking about the cost allocation issue to draw a very clear line between transmission projects that are needed to maintain grid reliability and transmission projects that are essentially for the benefit of generation developers. In the New England system, we have exactly that split. If, there's, if it, through the regional planning process, lines are identified that are needed to maintain reliability on a regional basis, and the NSTAR line in Boston was exactly one such line, then we support the, the socialization of costs across the entire region because it benefits everyone within the region to maintain the reliability of the grid. Um, so the, end, the cost of the NSTAR line was, is shared by everyone in New England. In Massachusetts, we are about half of the load. We pay about half of the bill. Similarly, the project that Commissioner Cohen referred to in Vermont, other projects that are on the books in New Hampshire and Maine and Connecticut, all focused on reliability of the grid, are projects for which, even though they are not within Massachusetts, Massachusetts will, consumers will pay half of. It is a vitally important component of cost allocation that when looking at reliability, there would be a willingness within an integrated power grid to share that cost across load. The distinction I want to make here is that the issue of cost allocation for building lines to interconnect generation resources departs from that. We want the, the, in order for our consumers to be protected, we want the cost of developing generation, including the cost of meeting compliance measures, the cost, the cost of delivering power reliably to load and making sure you don't adversely impact the reliability of the system to be borne by the generation developer and included in the price that they are charging customers. I really appreciate that. Just, just one comment. I think this is a new approach that some of us are suggesting because there is a new uh, national need just as important for reliability, and that's to prevent the earth from turning into toast. So that's the reason for our thinking. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, Chair, the gentleman's time has expired again. There will be a second round of questions for all members who are interested. The um, Chair recognizes the general lady from the State of Wisconsin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I want to direct this question to Commissioner Azar. Um, one of the proposals that we hear uh, a lot about on Capitol Hill is the uh, possibility of a, a 760 kV line 
often known as the transmission superhighway. Um, and I would like to hear your insights on how a, a 765 KV overlay might affect a state, a profile like a state of Wisconsin. And if you could describe um, any concerns you might have that it would be detrimental to um, Wisconsin or others. What, thank you, Congresswoman. When you add a, a, a high voltage um, over, overlay into a state, you've got to make sure that the underlying system is built up to accept that. In Wisconsin, as uh, you, both you and I have noted, we've spent billions of dollars at this point in time designing a specific kind of system. The American Transmission Company has designed a 345 kV system. If there is a 765 overlay built into Wisconsin, we're going to, it's, it's essentially going to uh, mess up our, um, our very deliberate 345 kV design. So we're going to have to build up our underlying grid. Uh, that being said, you know, ultimately, uh, if, if Congress um, you know, gives us the mandates and uh, the group of states decide that the best thing to do would be a 765 grid overlay, then we're going to need to accommodate that. But I think there are better ways to do it. The one size fits all uh, will likely be in my estimation, probably oversized and not cost effective. Um, you know, the one way in which I think about um, um, a 765 grid overlay is you've got a, somebody with a hose on one side of a swimming pool and he's got to get the water to the other side of the swimming pool. There's a drain at the other side of the swimming pool. There's two ways, two options he's got. One, he can extend the hose, or the second option is he fills up the swimming pool. And the 765 grid overlay is more akin to filling up the swimming pool than extending the hose. So I, th I think there are better ways to do it than one size fits all. Bottom line is, the primary message is, we need to do the calculus. We can figure this out. A tailor-made answer is better than a sort of generic answer. Um, another proposal that we hear a lot about that's been floated is um, making uh, RTOs the final decision makers with regard to transmission decisions. And I wonder how you would analyze this as um, an option. Do you think that RTOs have um, all the uh, correct interests in mind when they, um, when they would approach these sort of decisions? You know, the decision maker in selecting the plan for the, the grid needs to be beholden to only one interest, and that's the public interest. Uh, the RTOs are, um, they've got a lot of different stakeholders and they're very adept and I compliment them on trying to, um, to, to balance the competing needs of the stakeholders. But I can speak for the Midwest independent system operator. They actually have a contractual obligation to their transmission owners to maximize the revenues of the transmission owners. And um, it's, when you've got those kind of interests, they will not be thinking about the public interest when they're, be, when they're making their decisions. They will be thinking about their contractual obligation to the transmission owners. So, no, I do not believe the RTOs should be the ultimate decision maker in this. That being said, their expertise with regards to planning and their planning engineers absolutely needs to be involved in this process. I don't know if Mr. Cohen or, or Mr. Hibbert have any comments on that same question. Mm -hmm. Well, I would concur with, with Commissioner Azar's comments as well. As would I. Okay, great. Uh, thank the gentlelady. The chair will recognize himself for another round of uh, questions. Let me move to you, uh, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Hibbert, uh, so that we can put this out on the table. A, a lot of people, when they think of uh, the solar revolution, they think, well, we're going to bring it in from the deserts of the United States and bring it into the cities of our country. And that is true. And I also think that when we consider wind, that we're going to go out to the prairies of the United States and we're going to bring it in to the cities in order to provide the electricity. But people don't really think about the oceans as much as a source in the future of renewable electricity. And you made a reference to all of the eastern states uh, governors from uh, Maine down to uh, Virginia who uh, are very concerned that their plans for bringing in wind off of the coastline or uh, other renewable sources might be undermined by this kind of a proposal. Uh, could you talk about that and, and, and talk about what your 
vision is, that is, the, all of these governors in terms of what the long-term renewable prospects are for the East Coast? Certainly. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, in Massachusetts and I think throughout the New, New England region, we are strongly supportive of the climate goals that are inherent in the ACES legislation and the renewable goals. Um, certainly in Massachusetts we are, and we want to find the best way to meet them. Uh, we see offshore wind as being an enormous renewable potential uh, for, the, for the coastlines of our country, uh, a, a potential that is very close to load centers and can interconnect in multiple locations uh, on the lower voltage type networks that Commissioner Azar mentioned in a way that will strengthen the reliability of the grid. Uh, in that it represents uh, there is also a huge amount of onshore renewable potential up and down the East Coast. The concern that we have is that by, if you take, for example, what is included in the Joint Coordinated System Plan, it would essentially dump. Could you expand on what that is? Sure. It is a multi-regional plan that was done, I, I think, coordinated by MISO, uh, but stakeholders. Can you, can you explain what MISO is? <laughs> the oh, could you, as, as you all continue your testimony. We have C-SPAN watching this. And I think it would be a very interesting subject if it was actually communicated in English to the, uh, to the watching audience. So we are going to be on acronym alert okay. for the rest of this hearing. And I am going to stop you every time you use an acronym. Okay. I am sorry, Mr. Every time you make an assumption that everyone in the room knows what you are talking about. You're, this is a very important issue that has a very profound impact on families. So please explain what you are talking about. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will try not to use a lot of acronyms. I hope my Boston accent is okay, though. I, I, um, you, you sound very eloquent. I, all, these, <laughs> all of the other people in this room have such funny accents, don't they? I agree. Um, How about a, those Red Sox and Yankees last night, huh? Isn't well, you it? know, I was, I was going to, on a personal note, commend you for your astute observations uh, about the link between our national economy and baseball, because we are seeing signs that our economy is approving, and it occurred to me that at the same time, if you watch the Red Sox once again sweep the Yankees over the past few days, David Ortiz is hitting home runs again. I, I'm so going to just stop right here. I'll, I'll give you an extra minute just so everyone, again, people, <laughs> pe people won't know what you're talking about. I gave a speech in Boston on Monday, and I said that I said in Boston that the um, uh, that the economy was in a David Ortiz-like slump, <laughs> but that I had faith that our economy and David Ortiz would be hitting home runs again. Now, unfortunately, the Boston Globe ran a little editorial the next day questioning my judgment and linking David Ortiz's recovery to the American economy. <laughs> that night, David Ortiz hit a home run. Last night, David Ortiz hit a home run. Today and yesterday, we got, received all this new positive um, commentary about uh, the American economy. Um, I'm not saying it's directly related to my speech on Monday. However, uh, I do believe that, uh, and I thank you for pointing this out, that my comments were accurate. So please continue and we'll add back okay. the time onto your state. I'll see if I can remember the original question. <laughs> There, there was uh, what I think is, is gone hand in hand with the efforts to push for expanded uh, federal oversight over transmission. I have been a couple of major studies done recently by DOE and also done by uh, a group of regional planning entities across the country to look at this idea about how do we actually expand the development of renewable generation in the parts of the country where it exists and move that across the, the multiple regions and deliver it into sub-regions. Um, so the Joint Coordinated System Plan was a very large technical analysis of how to go about doing that, what the transmission network would look like, a high voltage, super high voltage transmission network would look like to accomplish that result. Um, as part of that plan, when you look at it, one of the things it does is it would dump on extra high voltage lines on the order of several thousand megawatts of power into New England at a very high voltage. Now, in addition to the issues that Commissioner Azar has, has mentioned, um, that would require a lot of building out of the transmission network within New England. The concern I have is that we have a competitive market framework in New England that is absolutely essential to keep co commodity prices low for our consumers. Um, we have a need in the region over the next couple of decades only on the order of several hundred to 1,500 megawatts for new power. If we were to administratively 
put in a large high voltage transmission line that put that quantity of power into our region, it would eliminate the market signals that our local renewable resources require in order to move forward with financing and development. So that is the threat. Our position is we absolutely have to meet the carbon goals uh, that, that uh, the country is now warming up to and that we need to meet in the coming years. But the way to do that is to do it through ensuring that the resources that are brought online are those that make the most sense to customers from the standpoint of the delivered price of electricity. And we think we can do that without this level of overs federal oversight. So if, if I may, so one of your concerns and New England's concerns generally, those six states, would be that as you put together regional plans to generate renewable electricity uh, within the region, offshore or onshore, there is a huge project up in Aroostook, um, a county in Maine that uh, could be uh, ultimately in the thousands of megawatts if, uh, if it is built out completely. But there will be an issue there of getting that electricity down into the population areas. But nonetheless, it is contained within New England that have had historic relationships and worked through all of the reliability, cost allocation and siting issues over the years. But you would be concerned that if there was some superimposed decision made to build transmission lines in, from other parts of the country, that that would then change the, the economics of developing the renewables that are indigenous to Massachusetts and uh, New England, whether it be in Arista County, Maine, or it be off the coastline uh, of, of uh, New England. I think, and I'll add this as well, one of the things that is not well understood about the East Coast <clears throat> of the United States is that when you go out 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, 40 miles, you're still only in 200 feet of water. When you go out that far on the west coast, you're out you're miles deep in the ocean. And so in terms of these siting issues along the east coast, fall wind especially, you can go out miles and miles and still be just hundreds of feet from having to uh, site these wind uh, facilities and then with superconducting technologies just bring them in to the shore and hook them into the pre-existing uh, a grid that, uh, that already is there in New England, with the states having to work out, of course, what the cost allocation is. But knowing that all of New England, for example, and New York, for that matter, and New Jersey and Maryland are all committed uh, to resolving uh, and, co and cooperating in the production of new renewable energy resources. So uh, just opening up this whole question of the, of the remote areas of, of Maine, for example, most people don't know that 95 percent of Maine is forest. It's woods. It's rural. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity there as well, although, and, and it's a huge state as well. So I just raised that issue because we have to strike a balance here uh, it, because we do want each region's indigenous resources to be developed as well. Let me uh, just stop there and uh, recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for uh, his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was expecting you to recognize Mr. Inslee there first. No, he, so. he has already been recognized for okay. his first round, so okay. I, I think it's appropriate for you to be recognized. Then I will recognize Mr. Inslee. Well, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Chairman Wellinghoff for his hospitality this week, and uh, I think your testimony was rational. Uh, I noticed one thing, though. Uh, you were seeing, seeming to uh, advocate that the Fed has a significant large role and the state uh, Regulators were all uh, uh, saying, "Well, uh, the states should have a larger role, and the Fed should have a little, a littler role." So uh, I guess that's not too surprising. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, ask you, though, do you think that the U.S. Uh, faces significant technical hurdles, or do you think uh, it's mostly political hurdles to improving our national grid? Uh, thank you, Congressman McInerney. Uh, first, on the issue of, of the, the federal role, I, I really believe that we should primarily defer to the states. I mean, I think what we need is, is to have federal pressure to ensure that the states can move forward with interconnect-wide regional planning, siting, and cost allocation. But I largely agree with uh, Commissioner Azar and her testimony. I think that really it needs to be primarily informed by the states. We certainly, though, have to have some entity who would overlook that state uh, activity to ensure that the national goals are also incorporated into the, what the states Well, and I liked her, uh, Ms. Azar's 
a suggestion that we lock all the state uh, people in one room until some decisions are made. But I don't know that that's really going to happen. But on your second question with respect to whether it's technical or po political, I think it's a, it's a good mix of both. And on the technical side, I think it's important to understand that, uh, and I, I know that New England and the, and the eastern seaboard states are very interested in offshore wind, and I support offshore wind. I think that's a great resource. But what we have to understand that they're not an island either. They are interconnected to the entire eastern interconnect. So for example, if we had offshore wind from uh, Rhode Island, New Jersey, uh, New York, all the way up through New England, um, put, in, put in place, developed at say 10 gigawatts, 10,000 megawatts of wind, put into the east coast. We could not simply, as I understand it from my reliability engineers, simply interconnect that into the existing grid. Right. We, in fact, if we had that happen and we had as little as perhaps 2,500 or 3,000 megawatts of that go offline, we could black out Florida. So we ultimately need to look at how to strengthen the entire interconnect so that all the regions, in fact, can meet their renewable goals and can do it with their local renewable resources and with distant renewable resources if necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Halvey, I certainly appreciate your uh, work toward the western uh, uh, region. Uh, I understand that um, your desire to streamline the permitting process, do you have any specific recommendations along those lines? Yes, I, I think a couple, of, a couple of recommendations. One, because of the work that we're doing with regard to the Western Renewable Energy Zones project, um, we think it will become very clear very quickly which areas represent the most uh, uh, desirable, the richest, uh, and the most developable renewable resource zones. Given that identification, we think that there is the opportunity uh, to prioritize those areas. Where they exist uh, in concert with federal lands, uh, we, we believe that there should be a priority given to the permitting on, on those areas. Same thing with the transmission lines that would be necessary to move that power from those renewable energy zones uh, to the market centers where it is needed. One of the other aspects of, of the project is that we will identify, uh, conceptually at least, where the transmission lines need to be uh, in order to use that, that, uh, um, that power. So you are really addressing the prioritization, not the actual process of purpose? Well, no, I, I, we think it is both. I think it's one, one recommendation is the prioritization. The second um, is, is that to look at the requirements and, and um, it, it certainly limit the, the number of requirements um, that agencies have to go through that have no value added in terms of that permitting process, that there is a way to protect wildlife, that there is a way to address environmental values, um, that there is a way to go through these processes and not take the kind of time that we are seeing uh, with, with many of these applications. Okay, I agree. Uh, and I just want to remark on Mr. Hibbert's uh optimism that uh, offshore wind can be as uh, significant as it can and uh, the fact that it is proximate to uh, load centers and that is an important consideration as opposed to putting in a lot of transmission. So I appreciate that. Um, and also the observation about just putting in large transmission capacity can have a, a negative impact on renewables. So those are uh, appreciated. Those comments are appreciated. And that, with that I will yield back. Great. Gentlemen's time. As expired, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. I, I wanted to, to read uh, just a little portion of Commissioner Azar's testimony and then ask a couple of questions to the three of you about it. Uh, Commissioner Azar said, uh, Congress can and should play an important role in bolstering and catalyzing state efforts by setting clear mandates and guidelines, as well as strict deadlines for state and regional transmission planning efforts. If these planning efforts fail to meet these mandates or deadlines, Congress can set up additional backstop authority for federal agencies to take action and ensure that projects identified in the regional planning efforts move forward. Uh, I'm paraphrasing now, examples of the type of leadership uh, that would be helpful include the following, and then um, the Commissioner lists four things, but and the fifth thing is clear and powerful backstop authority for federal action to plan for, approve, and site transmission lines that are identified as vital in the state-led transmission planning process. I agree essentially with that statement I, and I think in a bill I've introduced and I, I think heads in that direction. The question I'd like to ask Mr. Hibbard, Commissioner Azar, and uh, Chairman Wellinghoff is um, Mr. Hibbard has identified this issue that he doesn't want to see offshore wind intruded upon by, say, 
coal coming in from Ohio or somewhere else. And uh, I believe if we do have this backstop authority, we can and should build something in that would make sure that we preserve our goal of enhancing low carbon based fuels as part of what you might think of as bonus backstop federal authority. Is there a way to do that? And if you could give us your thoughts on the best way to do that, as I just start with Mr. Hibbert, if we were going to adopt this backstop federal authority, what would you encourage us to do to prevent the scenario that, that, that you fear? Well, let me start by saying I think that the legislation as it stands contains that backstop authority. By setting a cap on carbon and by setting a floor on renewable resource development, you are providing competitive markets the market signal they need to spur the development. The question you are posing is what if that is not enough? What if at some point we, we look and we see that for whatever reason we are not getting the level of development of renewable and low carbon resources to meet our clear caps and our clear floors? Um, my, what I would urge um, all of you to consider is to try to come up with a framework that does so while maintaining the importance of competitive market solutions. Um, again, we, under FERC's leadership, um, our wholesale competitive markets in New England are critical for keeping prices low to consumers. And not violating that is extremely important. Now, are there ways to do that? The one example I can give you is that in Massachusetts, we recently enacted legislation that requires our distribution utilities to enter into long-term delivered price contracts with renewable, with renewable power sources so that the utilities themselves would, would issue solicitations and would select the lowest cost option for meeting that goal of the Massachusetts State Legislature. You could consider something along the same lines where at some point you could evaluate whether or not um, the country is heading towards meeting its carbon cap and its renewable power floor. And if there is a deficiency identified, have FERC step in in essentially a backstop planning mode and require that regions, RTOs, utilities, or interconnecting um, transmission owners issue solicitations for long-term contracts for renewables on a delivered price. I want to make sure I have the other two. If you can kind of wrap up, I want to make sure we get the other two witnesses. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I am optimistic that if Congress sets the goals and sets the process and has a strong backstop authority um, that we'll be able to get this done. Um, if we don't get it done, again, I think that's when the role of FERC steps in. So if FERC, for instance, if, if the states came um, up with a specific plan and the plan did not meet the objectives of Congress that, that Congress set, um, I think there needs to be essentially an overseer and I personally would be fine with that being the federal government saying, yeah, this plan actually uh, um, meets those objectives. But the plan itself has to be designed by the states. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman Inslee. <clears throat> uh, just to respond to, to Mr. Hibbert, I, I want to make very clear that FERC is very committed to competitive market solutions. And we wouldn't choose to do anything that would be contrary to that. But I, I think when we look at transmission, there are some non-market barriers, and those include the issues of siting and cost allocation. And again, agreeing with uh, Commissioner Azar, I think that it's necessary to allow the states to move forward in those areas to see if they, fact, in fact, can do some interconnect-wide planning collectively, that they're moving forward to do that both in the eastern and western interconnects, and then see from that if the siting and cost allocation can be agreed upon. But if not, we have to, I think, have that pressure, that federal pressure behind it to inform that process to make sure that it moves forward to ensure that we meet our national goals. Thank you. Great. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. Um, the Chair recognizes uh, the gentlelady from Wisconsin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, when, I, when I hear the discussions about uh, connecting decoded wind generation through transmission to um, uh, load centers on the East Coast, I sort of feel like Wisconsin could become a state that has a, an extension cord just running through it. Uh, uh, maybe I should use the swimming pool analogy <laughs> instead. but. Um, it, it, that's the image that it, it conjures up for me, and um, 
I, I worry that it disincentivizes distributed generation. Um, and as I pondered in my opening statement earlier this morning, how we propose to pay for the transmission upgrades that are coming down the pike um, is a critical question. Will those who do not receive the extensive benefits of this transmission have to pay for the costs of traversing lines across the country? Uh, the rate, paper, rate payers that I represent, as you've already heard, have supported their share of more than $2 billion of new investments in the Wisconsin uh, transmission system. Clearly, there are transmission technology decisions that need to be made, and there are cost allocation decisions that need to be made. But I guess I would ask the uh, whole panel and anyone who wants to comment you know, how we best protect those rate payers, how we set up this system in a way to best protect those rate payers who will not be receiving the huge benefits of, of this, uh, 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 this, this um, transmission buildup. If I may jump in, Congressman, um, I, I think the model of, uh, that I've been discussing here this morning of requiring that the cost on a, of transmission associated with moving generation from the generation source to market be included in the price that's offered to consumers that will be purchasing it is our first line defense on that. So that if transmission were coming from the Dakotas and being put into New England, the price of that would include not just the cost of developing the generation, but also the cost of the transmission. We can then compare that price to other generation prices available to us within the New England market for local renewables, for demand resources, uh, or for more traditional generation, and that ultimately the projects that will go forward will be the ones that benefit ratepayers. As far as cost allocation, I don't think we can actually speak to what would be the best cost allocation at this point in time. It should be tailor-made to the grid that is essentially planned. Um, as I mentioned in my um, initial comments, if you pick a specific cost allocation right now, it's likely to steer the plan in a specific direction. And I'd rather have the physics drive the physics and the economics drive the plan, and then we can figure out how to pay for it after the plan is designed. So that, that's my recommendation. As a, uh, as a Vermont commissioner, I would concur with my colleague from Massachusetts uh, as to, uh, as from a NARUC perspective, uh, well, we would be looking to, uh, to take a position case by case as it comes forward. And again, I would agree with Commissioner Azar. We should not uh, dictate a particular method, number one. Um, but number two, I, I, you know, my preference would be to have the states try to work it out ultimately. And if those states that were uh, involved in the uh, line, the line went across the state, but th that state could make a case that there wasn't real benefits to that state, but hopefully that solution could be, could be worked out and, and, and ultimately resolved in a, in a collaborative way. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if the decision had to be made and it couldn't be made by the states and the region collectively, uh, I think f it would be appropriate for FERC to determine that allocation. And the allocation, in fact, may decide that a particular state like Wisconsin did not benefit, depending upon the, the, the uh, definition and, and, uh, and breadth of, of the, uh, of the uh, term benefit to, uh, uh, from a particular line, and as such may not be allocated costs. But again, you have to provide the flexibility for that uh, kind of a decision to be made. You can't restrict uh, specifically uh, or dictate in a rule how that has to be done. It has to be in, in a very, very broad, re in a broad way that allows FERC to meet its mandate to ensure that rates are just and reasonable. Great. Let me now turn and recognize once again the gentleman from California uh, for another round of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I had a, a question for uh, Commissioner Azar. Um, you had some recommendations for congressional action to facilitate um, projects, transmission projects. Do you feel that those tra uh, recommendations are widely shared across the country uh, by state, state commissioners? Uh, I have not had the opportunity to float that idea by my uh, colleagues, so I can't speak to that. Okay, thank you. Well, that's my only question, and I yield back. 
I thank the gentleman. Um, chair will recognize himself and uh, just to pursue a few questions here. Um, Mr. Hibbard, um, perhaps you could deal. Mr. Wellinghoff said that uh, if there was 3,000, 5,000 megawatts of wind brought in uh, from offshore up in New England, that it could cause reliability problems down in Florida. But the converse could also be true, huh? That what Florida Power and Light, and hopefully someday the Southern Company, is doing in uh, Florida to generate renewable electricity could cause reliability problems up in New England. Um, how do we resolve that issue? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, the issue, the engineering issue that the Chairman refers to is really one of the size of the transmission and the associated capacity being put onto the transmission network in the region. So, for example, if, as Commissioner Azar was referring to, you have a 765 kV line and it's dumping. You know, I'm saying, you know, just, can you imagine the audience right now? All right. <laughs> okay, what is that? Can you, what, okay. what is that? If you have a really extra high voltage line, what does that mean? Dropping a lot of. No, what does that mean? What, what, how, how, a dropping? Well, well, what does that think, mean? <laughs> think of it this way. There's okay, way try to, again. Okay. When a transmission line interconnects or hooks up with the transmission system in New England, it looks like a generating facility. So if you have a really high voltage line, it looks like a really big power plant. So when people are, are riding down the street or out on the highway and they look off, and they see something, explain it in those terms, just so they can understand why people's sensibilities might be affected by what it is that's constructed, so that you can put it in those terms, because 765 kilovolts doesn't really mean anything to people. Right. Well, I mean, what they would actually see is a really big tower, but from the, from the uh, standpoint of, of how it affects the grid, it <coughs> just puts a lot of electricity onto the grid in a single location, and if that were suddenly to disappear, then there could be problems if the transmission system can't withstand it mm -hmm. and cause the type of widespread outage okay. um, that, that he was referring to. The value I see in offshore wind technology along the eastern seaboard is it completely overcomes that problem because it can be built out incrementally at lower voltages that hook on individual lines into the major load centers along the east coast so that we can build it out without the need for increasing the reliability, the potential reliability risk on the underlying transmission system. So that while I think if we were to take the path of interconnecting 3,000 megawatts in a single point, that would be the problem that the chairman is referring to, but that offshore wind has the potential to be dispersed on a much more widespread geographic basis and actually potentially enhance the reliability of the grid. And Mr. Wellinghoff, would that solve your Florida problem? or from our perspective, our New England problem? I, I'm not sure that it would, Mr. Chairman. Could uh, you explain uh, why? I, I'm not sure that it would, Mr. Chairman. No. Ult ultimately, um, even though you may disperse the 3,000 megawatts over a number of, of locations, the issue is going to be the variability of that wind and the effect of that variability on reliability across the interconnect with respect to frequency. Um, and, and, and I have actually directed our reliability division to commence a study that will look at this issue and determine how that uh, incursions in frequency can affect reliability across both the eastern and or western interconnect. All right, Mr. Hibbard, you're back at a FERC hearing right now. What are you going to say to Mr. Wellinghoff when they raise that issue? Uh, first, I will commend uh, the chair and FERC for looking into the Always issue wise. of reliability. Yeah, good, good, good. <laughs> And, uh, and I would encourage them to consider in, a, in that study the difference between variability of three or four or 5,000 megawatts being uh, connected at a single point to the variability and the impact of it being spread over a very wide geographic region. And whatever the outcome is, I'm certain it would be the right answer. And, and, and would you agree that there could be a distinction made between a concentrated renewable a source and something that is dispersed over uh, hundreds or thousands of miles? Mr. Chairman, I try to not practice electrical engineering without a license, but I, I would agree there, there may be a difference between the two. Okay, thank you. And by the way, would those same issues exist in a western state, for example, that might want to produce three or four or 10,000 megawatts of renewable in their state and try to move that, for example, into uh, a metropolitan area in another state or several other states, would it create the very same issue? 
Yes, it could be applicable in either either interconnect. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so it's an issue that we ultimately have to resolve here. Um, I, I think that going back to this uh, 765 kilovolt issue is an important thing to understand uh, because, uh, in my experience, at least on this committee for 33 years, um, there are look at, there are corporate entities that really think big. The bigger the facility, the bigger the plan, the better it is. And then there are others that think, well, maybe we can disperse you know, the way in which we generate electricity. Maybe we can uh, do this in a way that, and here it's going to be increasingly important uh, to generate um, solar and wind and other renewables from more dis dis uh, dispersed sources. Uh, where the, and that's to a certain extent where the uh, smart grid comes in. You know, so that uh, we're doing it. And we not only need a smart grid, but we need smart people planning a smart grid so we don't overbuild it uh, <clears throat> and put those burdens back on uh, to, the, um, to the consumer. And we saw all of that happen back in the uh, 1970s and early 80s, where all of these nuclear power plants that were guaranteed to be needed by the year, if we didn't build 500 new nuclear power plants, they told us by the year 2000, we would have blackouts all over America. So we need to think big, put all these costs on the uh, shoulders of ratepayers all across America. In the New England region, we really suffered from uh, the over um, <clears throat> enthusiasm, we'll say, of these big central planners. And so we have to be careful here that, that those types of, we'll call it uh, planners, <laughs> <laughs> don't control this process uh, because it's just the opposite era that we hope that we're uh, entering in terms of the development. And I can, I can just feel the hoofbeats of the large central planners, you know, moving towards this whole concept, right? And uh, and after, after 33 years, um, I'm kind of aware of what can happen. You know, there's an old saying that a smart man learns from his own mistakes and a wise person learns from other people's mistakes. Uh, but at my age in service in Congress, I'm an expert in both areas of mistakes. Uh, and so I just don't want to see that happen again. And, uh, and that overbuilding issue is really something that's quite important to me. So if you couldn't, Mrs. Azar, could you go to the question of ACDC? Uh, and First of all, explain to our viewing audience what that is and why different results occur depend upon, depending upon the decision which is made. Yes, the alternating current system is, is the primary transmission grid we have right now. Mm -hmm. And it's completely interconnected. So when you put an electron on that AC grid, it's going to go th to the path of least resistance. And we, with models, you can predict where it's going to go, but you can't direct it. It goes, the electron goes where it wants to go. On a DC line, it is actually very directed. It has one direction. You have very so DC means direct. Direct current. current. Thank you. The direct current line. You have a lot of control over it. The electron goes in one direction. You know, for instance, when you drop an electron in, on one end of a DC line, you know where it's going to end up. It's going to end up on the other side of the DC line. Whereas in an AC grid, if you drop an electron uh, at, at the same point, you're not quite sure what path it's going to take. Um, the only thing you know is you're pulling power off at certain locations. So it's a very there are two very different models. Okay, and for the purposes of our discussion today, how does that instruct this discussion in terms of the goals that we're seeking to achieve? You know, I, I can give two answers to that. One is we need to know what the goals are from Congress, and mm -hmm. then we're going to be able to decide which of those or the combination of the, both of them um, will solve the uh, problems that you're going to put forth to us. I can tell you from a personal perspective that um, the DC lines, if, if your problem is trying to get power from a fairly localized location, let's just say in the Dakotas, and you're trying to get it far east, um, it's, it's, as long as you're over 400 miles long, DC lines um, will likely be a very good solution to that problem. And Are they more or less expensive? Um, oh, that's a good question. As a general rule, I would say they're less expensive, but it depends on what kind you're building. Mm -hmm. uh, and that should be a decision, in your opinion, made by the regions? That is correct. Mm -hmm. And that could actually turn on how much burden is, paced, is placed upon uh, consumers in terms of their electricity bill each month? That is correct. Mm -hmm. um, 
Mr. Wellinghoff, um, if I may, you, you heard uh, Mr. Hibbard and others talk about what the impact would be of the, the Waxman-Markey bill on the marketplace. The signal will be sent uh, to move away from carbon um, producing electrical generation. There will be a national renewable electricity standard now as a result encompassing an additional 20 states. And he largely believes that that is going to now force states on a regional basis because of these national goals uh, to reach accommodation on these new lines and that the Federal Government is actually going to be less needed in the future, uh, perhaps with the exception of the Federal lands issue, um, uh, to resolve these issues. What is your response to that in terms of the – because we are trying to create a market-based response. Um, and I will just give you an analogy and perhaps you – or, or an, an analogous situation and perhaps you could reflect upon it. After we passed the 1996 Telecommunications Act, um, all of a sudden, there was an explosion of broadband deployment across the country. Uh, telephone companies, cable companies, others who had been telling the local PUCs, oh, it's not, in fact, cost effective to be deploying fiber optic or, you know, broadband technology, were now in a mad race to do so because there is now a new federal law which is placing a premium upon it. And by the time we reached 2000, we actually had a dot-com bubble because of the vast and very rapid deployment of broadband across our nation. Now, we created thousands of new companies. Some survived, some didn't, but it was great for our country in the long run. Is there any reason to believe that the legislation as it's now drafted won't unleash a similar um, um, and, and very, very significant um, deployment of renewables across the country and kind of press regions and individual utilities to finally resolve their longstanding uh, uh, Call it, I won't call it opposition, I'll call it skepticism. Because I saw it in the telephone sector, I saw it in the cable sector. They moved overnight uh, to changing their perspective. Do you think the legislation will do that? And as a result, perhaps this federal role isn't going to be as needed, with the exception of the federal lands issue? Well, well certainly, as you're, you're aware, Chairman Markey, there's approximately 29 states now that have renewable portfolio standards. And in fact, and, and my state, Nevada, is one of those. We have a standard that's 20 percent by 2015, so it's far ahead of, uh, of, of most state standards. And those standards have, in fact, created markets, created markets for renewable energy and moved renewable energy into those markets very effectively. So I think that's happening already on the, on the one hand. But on the other hand, I have people coming into my office who tell me that wind is being curtailed in the Midwest because we don't have adequate transmission. So. That tells me we, ha we have a problem. It is not simply the markets are creating these new markets for renewables. It is the need to somehow ensure that this transmission gets built to make it deliverable. We need to make it deliverable. You are saying that the states are not um, cooperating in the Midwest in the transmission of wind. No, I am not, I'm not saying necessarily the states or the Federal Government. I think it is a combination of the fact that we have certain barriers, which include issues of planning, siting and cost allocation that need to be re-looked at in ways that we can facilitate more transmission. But, but, but you are saying the Fed, you are basically saying the Federal Government needs more authority because the states aren't doing the job in moving that wind around in the Midwest. I'm, think, I'm, I'm saying that ultimately what we need to do is ensure that the states understand no, and I appreciate those, that. The, the, those priorities and that, in fact, we but you're have... But you're saying they will need that in addition to the new law which we're passing, which will create all those incentives for utilities to move and the states to move. You're saying that that's not going to be sufficient, that you believe that the states themselves have some built-in inertia and some of those utilities do as well, and that uh, because, uh, because they don't move, even though we pass this new law and create these high goals that have to be met uh, by, by national mandate, that we, we will still need the Federal Government to come in as a club. Is that what you are saying? I am saying that I, I, I'm not blaming the states, nor am I saying the Federal Government is the panacea. I'm ultimately saying right, but you we can't. Here's the problem in terms of, and I appreciate what you're saying, and you're trying, you're engaging in a bit of terminological inexactitude, which is necessary for you to maintain good relationships with the states, and I appreciate the position that I'm putting you in. But at the same time, we're going to create a 
brand new law here that is going to affect all these states. That's correct. And so we need some evidentiary basis for uh, preempting the states that is based upon, you know, a federal perception of the problem that exists in these states. So uh, while we won't use the word blame, uh, we need to find some way in which we pinpoint what it is that is occurring uh, that is the problem and then we can tailor our solution to it. But we can't deal with it in kind of broad generalities. We need to have the specifics and then even in the report language of the legislation we can ensure that we're, we're explaining the problem as it exists, let's say, in a particular region. And uh, and here we're talking about the Midwest and the fact that wind is not moving around even though it's readily available. So pinpointing what that problem is helps us then to tailor the language to reflect that problem. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that Midwestern problem, where the bottlenecks are, what causes it, and then we can kind of contemplate, cogitate on what might be necessary. And I'm suggesting part of the bottlenecks are the fact that, number one, FERC really doesn't have the authority to allocate across boundaries. So between MISO and PJM, for example, we don't have the ability to allocate costs of transmission across these boundaries. And as such, we're not really getting the types of transmission built. And I think you're going to hear from Mr. Walsh from ITC on the next panel. And he has a very interesting transmission project that I would uh, commend you to to uh, explore this with him further, because he is in the Midwest trying to get large amounts of wind out of the Dakotas into the Chicago area. And I think one of his issues he's talking about is cost allocation across two regions. So what I'm suggesting ultimately is that Congress needs to look at an entire structure of planning, siting, and cost allocation that is initially deferred to the states. And I would say that the states should, in fact, ultimately solve that problem. But if they can't, then the pressure should be there to allow the federal government to step in if necessary. You know, th thank you, Mr. Wallinghoff. Um, uh, you know, I was, the, uh, I was the author in 1992 of the wholesale transmission access provisions uh, in, that, uh, in the Energy Policy Act that for the for very first time gave the FERC the ability to force utilities to stop blocking requests for open and non-discriminatory access to wholesale transmission lines so that there could be more competition in that area. The FERC then built upon that new law that I created and issued a, a generic order, Order 888, on transmission access, which is a historic you know, order, and that's based upon my 1992 law. So I'm very sensitive to this issue, but again, I don't think we should tailor something that goes beyond what is needed. Um, and I say this to you, uh, Chairman Wellinghoff, is that part of the problem we have up in Massachusetts and New England as well is uh, with the, and it's not you, it's your predecessor, uh, FERC, that has just left office, but uh, preempting our state and local governments from granting FERC siting uh, authority on, um, on wholesale electric transmission lines. Uh, that issue is illuminated by the fact that the FERC has seemed to be completely unresponsive to our local concerns when it comes to the siting of uh, the uh, liquefied natural gas facility uh, in, um, in Fall River, Massachusetts. Um, uh, I have an LNG facility in my district in Everett, Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts, working with the federal government, has licensed two LNG facilities about 10 miles off of our coastline to bring in uh, uh, LNG into our market and into the New England market. It's upwards now of 30 percent of the natural gas that we use in New England, and we support LNG and we have licensed two facilities. But notwithstanding Massachusetts saying to the FERC, we don't need another one on land, we're doing it offshore and we've licensed them, the FERC, not your FERC, but the FERC up until this point has been saying, no, you're going to have another one uh, in Massachusetts. And even that decision itself could affect the amount of renewables that we need. Right? It could, notwithstanding the fact that natural gas may be half of the carbon in its uh, use as coal, uh, it's not nearly as good as renewables will be. But it's going to affect our marketplace by having that be forced upon us. And the FERC is, um, you know, in, it has been pressing that now for the last four or five years. So that kind of calls into question 
you know, kind of this federal one-size-fits-all uh, process where even when the state is saying back off, the FERC continues to come in and says, no, this is what you are going to have for New England. So how do we reconcile that, Mr. Wellinghoff? Well, Mr. Chairman, I am not suggesting a one-size-fits-all process. Again, I am suggesting, unlike the LNG process, where FERC has the primary and initial responsibility with respect to siting and permitting that, in fact, States be given the initial opportunity in this regard. And uh, that, that opportunity, I think, should be given uh, uh, all, all the tools necessary for it to succeed. Okay. I thank you, Mr. Wellinghoff. And uh, are there other members who wish to ask questions of this panel? Let me recognize the gentlelady from Wisconsin. Thank you. Just, just one more rather big question, but I, I appreciate the chairman for asking our witnesses to make this understandable for a, a, a viewing audience. And, and, and we had a discussion recently, of, you know, follow the electrons. And I actually would like to pose a question about following the money. I, I ask anyone who wants to um, give just a very brief primer on the economics of transmission. Is there a guaranteed rate of return? How is that determined? Who decides? And if so, what is that guaranteed rate of return for um, transmission? Congresswoman Baldwin, I'll, I'll, I'll attempt that. As I like to believe um, in rate-based regulation and transmission is not, first of all, you have to understand transmission is not a market item. It's an item that we have um, limited number of entities who are um, putting in transmission and it is under a rate-based cost of service scheme. So they are authorized uh, a return on their investment and they have an opportunity to earn a return. But to earn that return, they have to manage uh, their expenses and they have to manage their operations in an efficient way to ensure that their expenses match what their projections are so that their return comes out to the, the, the level that they, they, they hope to achieve. Uh, the regulators, whether it be a state regulator or a federal regulator, would authorize a level of return on equity that would be, uh, would be authorized. But again, that's, that's only an opportunity to earn that level of return. Do you have any averages of, of what that rate of return might look like? I'm sorry, what it might look like? What is the average rate of return? I know there's variables, but I'm sorry, I, I can, I, I'll be glad to submit or... that to you in writing, but I don't have an average today for you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I thank the gentlelady. Um, and I thank all of our witnesses. You've been absolutely fantastic. And, and you, Mr. Wellinghoff, I want to tell you how much we appreciate um, your willingness to take on this job. This is one of the toughest jobs we're going to have in America. Uh, you have an outstanding record. And, uh, and I've already had an extensive conversation with you privately. And, and, uh, and I really am very, very glad you have this job. I think you're going to do a tremendous, tremendous uh, service to our country uh, there in that position. It's very sensitive. It's going to require uh, people like you who are willing to spend the time to get this right so we have a long-term solution. Um, and as we're going forward, especially over the next week or so, um, we're going to need some specifics to help us to think through this issue in terms of where the problems have been, you know, what has caused the problems and what would be needed in order to correct those problems. Okay? We will need some examples and some specifics in, with regard to what you know, has, has been used as a blocking mechanism uh, to the resolution of these regional uh, issues because we want to get at that issue. We want to have real competition out there in the marketplace. So for you especially, Mr. Chairman, we, we hope that we can work with you in the next week. Uh, you have an outstanding staff and you are an outstanding individual and I think we can accomplish that. We would be happy to do that, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for your kind I Thank you. What I am going to do is to work now in reverse, and I am going to give each one of you one minute to tell us what you want us to remember as we consider this issue uh, over the next week. And uh, we will begin uh, down in this end with you, Mr. Halby. You each have one minute apiece. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I think the, the two things that we would emphasize uh, are, are the issue of supersizing, which re relates directly to the cost allocation issue uh, that we spoke about, 
um, it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to, to use up whatever goodwill we might have trying to locate a lot, excuse me, trying to uh, uh, locate a line that's undersized. Uh, the second thing is, I, I think, the federal lands issue, the, the, the permitting issue. Uh, I've elaborated some on that, but uh, this we see as, as, as a very large impediment. Um, th those would be the two things that I think uh, we'd like you to bear in mind. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Hibbard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would just say that certainly from our perspective in the Commonwealth, uh, we completely agree with the goals of the ACES legislation that we, it, that we absolutely have to address the carbon issue and we have to address it now. Uh, what I would urge you to consider on this, from the standpoint of transmission is to try to retain the competitive market structure that delivers benefits to our ratepayers in the designs that you implement going forward. The carbon cap that provides a value or cost of, of um, additional marginal costs associated with allowance purchase for fossil generating resources in a renewable portfolio floor that provides a different additional revenues to renewable resources should provide the financial incentives needed to get the renewables and the associated transmission built and that we want to maintain the distinction between who is responsible for paying for transmission if it is a generating facility and who is responsible if it is needed for reliability. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Commissioner Azar. Thank you. Number one, define the goals that we need to meet with the transmission grid. Number two, define a state-led process by which we can meet those goals. One of the primary aspects of that needs to be that the, the decision maker must be beholden only to the public interest. Uh, number three, um, ensure there is federal backstop authority so that uh, we get our job done. Number four, don't do harm. And with regards to that, don't define a specific technology and please don't define a cost allocation process. Thank you. Mr. Cohn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, very, very briefly, uh, I just want to reiterate that the states are here to help. Uh, we would like to work closely with your committee uh, in developing some transmission planning and that uh, federal preemption of uh, transmission siting should only be used as a last resort. Thank you. And Mr. Wellinghoff. Um, I would suggest that, that hopefully you come away with this, number one, that we are not as far apart as we initially seemed to be, I think, when we start out in our testimony, that we all have the same goals, to reduce carbon and to ultimately develop as much renewables as possible to do that. But I think we need to remember that there are non-market barriers that we need to look at to how to get that development done. And as part of those non-market barriers, I think we need to do put a construct together that would allow the states to initiate the processes of, of planning, siting, and cost allocation to have the transmission developed to deliver renewables. We also have to have that back pressure of the federal government standing there being able to, to step in if necessary to make it hap happen and get it done. Thank you, Mr. Wellinghoff, very much. And in the spirit of what Mr. Wellinghoff said, and it, it, we, na we, na we may not be as far apart uh, as the initial statements indicated, uh, let's work towards that goal. Um, we, we, time is of the essence, so all of these conversations now continued uh, uh, outside of this hearing room uh, over the next week or so would be very helpful to us. With the thanks of the committee, uh, this panel is dismissed and we will ask the next panel to uh, come up to the table. Thank you. Hmm? Excuse me? If he, if Massachusetts agrees? Okay. <laughs>